Hallelujah. We're going to embark on a new series tonight called Resilient Faith. Resilient Faith is our new series. The sermon title specifically for tonight, Shipwrecked Faith. You can see how those are opposite together. Praise the Lord. Father, we need your help tonight. In one sense, we want to come before you, open our hearts that you might teach us and train us. We are ultimately your disciples tonight, and yet we need your help. We need your help to separate us from the day that has just passed, from all of the worries and responsibilities that will come tomorrow. Father, we pray that in this moment, our mind and our spirit will be present, that we will not be somewhere else that we will have an intimate moment with you from your word. Help us tonight, Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. So we're starting this new series, Resilient Faith. It's going to be a study through the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy. And as we typically will start any new book of the Bible when we study it, we want to first look at the foundational needs. What is a foundational need? That means we need to understand the author, the audience, the intent of the author, and the historical and cultural background of the writing. If you don't understand those four things, you won't understand what the book is about. We won't understand how to apply the principles into our own life. We can fall subject to false theology and heresy and, and strange ways of thinking if we don't understand the author, the audience, the intent of the author, and the historical and cultural backgrounds of the writing. So that's where we're going to start tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to read the first two verses that are going to set our course. Paul, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Yeshua our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Yeshua the Messiah our Lord. So we get a few answers right in the first two verses. The author is the Apostle Paul. Paul is a Jewish rabbi. He comes from the group of the Pharisees. He proclaimed that about himself, that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul was a persecutor of the believers until he had a miraculous encounter with Yeshua himself. And it was at that point that Yeshua called Paul to be an apostle. So when he says, I'm an apostle, it's not so much that he's saying it about himself to carry a title, but rather it's a function of the calling of Yeshua, Paul the apostle. What does an apostle do? Well, an apostle plants new congregations. He identifies and trains future leaders. He oversees the progress of many congregations, and he oversees them in doctrine and in character growth. He oversees them in doctrine and in character growth. Why is that important to know the role of the apostle? Because it will show up here in the writings to Timothy. That Paul says, I'm an apostle, and I'm writing this letter to Timothy, my son in the faith. So now we've got two of our answers already. The author, Paul. The audience primarily is going to be Timothy, although it will also be those who Timothy leads. So we have two of our answers very early on. He's writing to Timothy, a disciple and a spiritual son. Now, Timothy's been working with Paul since they met together in Lystra, just after the Jerusalem council made their final decision in Acts chapter 15. So I'm going to take a quick aside so that we all understand the context. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is the section where all of the apostles and the senior leaders and many of the elders of Jerusalem all got together to discuss one very important question. And the question was this. Does a non-Jewish person have to be circumcised and follow the religious law of Moses in order to be saved and enter the kingdom of heaven? That was the question. Does a non-Jewish believer have to do these things in order to be a believer. So the council met together, Acts chapter 15. They gave testimony of what God was doing around the world, how the Holy Spirit was being poured out on Gentiles, even before they knew any 
of the Mosaic Law and any of the rituals. And it was decided in Acts chapter 15 that the non-Jewish believers did not have to follow the law of Moses in its ritualistic form, nor did they have to be circumcised in order to be saved. That was chapter 15. The very next chapter, chapter 16, is where Paul meets Timothy. Let me read it to you. It says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take Timothy along with him on the journey. And so he circumcised Timothy because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for all the people to obey. What decision had they reached? It was the decision of the Jerusalem council one chapter before in Acts 15. So right when Timothy and Paul meet together, they, they're given this task. And the task is to take this letter. You'll find it in Acts 15 and Acts 22 also. They're commissioned to take this letter to all of the congregations. And Timothy, the disciple of Paul, gets to go with him from the very beginning. Another side note. Notice that Timothy has one Jewish parent and one non-Jewish parent. And it's important here that Paul makes sure that he's circumcised. Because we believe that if you have one Jewish parent, then you're Jewish. We can prove that here from the New Testament where the mother's Jewish, but the father's not. And if you want to go back to the Tanakh and to the Old Testament, we can prove it there as well. We might remember the story of Moses and Moses' son, Gershom. Moses is Jewish. He's from the tribe of Levi, but he married Zipporah. Zipporah is not Jewish. So there you have one Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, and they must circumcise Gershom. But in the New Testament, we have a Jewish mother and not a Jewish father, and he still has to be circumcised. So it's important to note that in, in, in terms of the biblical context, we don't believe in half-Jewish. Because that would be a funny circumcision. We don't believe in a quarter Jewish. I do meet some people from time to time. They say, Pastor Chad, do you think I can become an Israeli citizen? I, I, I don't know. You have to tell me what your family history is like. Well, I'm, I'm 1 16th Jewish. <laughs> I don't think that's how, how God views his people. So that's an important side note. For the, all of you living in the diaspora around the world, if you're Jewish, please come home. Come home. Come live with us. Be where you're supposed to be. This is the land of your people. This is the land of promise. And we're waiting for you. This congregation is waiting for you to come be part of what we're doing here. So Paul is the author. Timothy is the audience, although we understand that the broader audience will be those that Timothy leads in faith. The intent of the letter is our next task. How can we know the intent? What does Paul mean to tell us? It's clearly expressed here in the next two verses because Paul is acting as the apostle for the congregation at Ephesus. This is a very famous congregation, the congregation at Ephesus. So let's look down at the next two verses, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. What was the intent? The intent was that Paul would encourage Timothy to stop people in the congregation from teaching false doctrines, to talk about myths and genealogies that didn't lead to good things. It led to division and discord in the congregation. So now we know the author is Paul. The audience is Timothy and those he will teach. The intent is that Timothy will become firm in his oversight of the Ephesian congregation. What does that mean? It means at this time that at Timothy is one of the leaders at Ephesus. 
a little history about the Ephesian congregation, if you do a little, little study historically, what you'll find out is that Paul spent at least three years in Ephesus, training leaders, establishing pastors and elders, right? And now Timothy's a leader. So Paul was a leader, and then Timothy's a leader. That's not a bad leadership team. And before Paul, history will show us that John was one of the first pastors at Ephesus. Now this is a dynamic leadership team. You've got John, the apostle, Paul, the apostle, and Timothy, a later apostle, but now a disciple of Paul, this is your first three leaders? Wow, what a congregation. I'm certainly not going to say that our leadership team is in that ballpark. But even with those leaders, watch what happens to the congregation when they get off point. When they start to argue about needless things. When they start arguing about myths and genealogies and heresies and false doctrines, watch what happens to the congregation, even though they had a dynamic set of leaders. That if the people themselves don't stay focused on the important things in the Word of God, even those congregations like the Ephesians can fall into foolish ways. John, Paul, Timothy, all of these have been leaders at Ephesus. To avoid conflict, Paul was telling Timothy, this is the intent of my writing. Make sure we don't let the congregation fall into these things. And this shows us the background of how Paul felt compelled to stay connected to the congregation at Ephesus, how he felt compelled to be the apostle, and how he felt compelled to continue to train Timothy. Now, what was Paul's command? Let's look at verse 5, 6, and 7. Now, when we read this next section, we need to think about how can we glean, how can we receive both personally in our life and congregationally here at King of Kings from these next few verses. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things that they affirm. You see, what he's saying is the people in the congregation, they stop talking together in a community group format. They stop talking together communally about the important matters of, of the Word of God. And they started to debate things that were on the fringe of importance. We often hear comments. We get them online. We get them through the phone, maybe in the mail, maybe in the lobby. And people will say, Pastor Chad, I never hear you talk a lot about eschatology. Why don't you preach more on the book of Revelation? And I say, listen, if we preach from the book of Revelation, and I'm sure we will, we're going to speak straightforward. It's going to be what the Bible says and only what the Bible says. And you won't hear a lot of commentary about what I think that imagery means or what that number means or what that timeline means or what that beast means or what that horn means or what the trumpet means or what the bowl means. And when you hear me preach from Revelation without commentary on all of the imagery, it's a very boring message. Because I don't have a lot of information to give you. And yet, you know, there are families and congregations that are splitting over what a bowl means. Or a trumpet. Or the color of the horse. Now, these are important things prophetically. And we're not downplaying their importance. And the Lord will reveal what they mean in His time. But it's not wise for us to debate such matters. Romans even says... Avoid things that are disputable and stick to the things that anchor us in faith. Paul sees this as a problem in Ephesus and he's commanding Timothy, stay strong in the faith, endure with a good conscience, but don't let the people go this route because it will, the congregation will implode from the inside. And you might say, well, why is that so important to promote love between the believers and have pure hearts and 
have a good and clear conscience, to be sincere in faith. Why is that so important? Because when the body of the Messiah doesn't know how to love one another and doesn't know how to prefer one another and they implode from the inside and we decay from the inside, the ultimate effect is that the believer on the outside doesn't get to see the truth of the kingdom of God through us. We become an embarrassment to the kingdom of God. We can't witness to those that don't know. What are we going to invite them into? Hey, friend, come into our congregation where we fight and we bicker all the time and we have no agreement and no one loves one another. Come on, come on in. They're going to say, you know what, that sounds like my job. That sounds like my family back at home. Why would I want to come to a place like that? And Paul knows that eventually it's not only about the love of one another, it's about the witness to the unbeliever on the outside. And Paul is a, a person who believes in kingdom expansion. And he knows that division from the inside stops the kingdom from moving forward. And that's a lesson for all of us in the house tonight. Division inside the house stops the kingdom from moving forward. Now God will find another way. He chooses to use us, but if he can't use us, he'll find someone else. And I don't know about you. I want to be used by God. I want to be used in the way that God wants to promote his kingdom. There's a destiny for this congregation and everyone in it. And we're not going to allow the enemy to let division and strife pull us apart and implode from the inside. Now, Paul also makes a distinction between the arguments, the foolish arguments of myths and genealogies versus the law of God. He doesn't want us to confuse that there's a healthy debate about the law of God. Of course there is. There's foundational pillars of faith that are not movable. In some ways, they're not even disputable. You know, did, did God create all things? Yes, there's no dispute. We, there's nothing to argue about there. Is Yeshua the Messiah? Yes, he is. Is he the only way to heaven? Yes, he is. Those are foundational pillars. There's no argument there. But let's look here at verse 11, uh, excuse me, 8 to 11. Same chapter. We're going to stay in this chapter all night. 8 to 11. It says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators and sodomites and the kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He's saying this list of things is what we avoid. We, we don't practice these things. And then he blankets it by saying, and anything else, anything else that doesn't go along with the doctrine. Remember, he's an apostle. It's his job to make sure the congregations under his care stay doctrinally accurate. And he's saying, if anything else, even if I forgot to name it, if anything else opposes the doctrine that we've laid out before you, reject it in the name of Yeshua. Now, if there are any parents in the house tonight, We've used this technique, have we not? I used it just this week. I said to my, my, my two younger ones, who are, who are pretty notorious, you know, there's a disease among children. And the disease is that they like to take things out, but they don't like to put things back. And my kids need to be healed of this disease as well. So my two youngest ones are pretty notorious. And so the other day, I, I did such a typical dad thing. You know, I'm getting so old. I'm such a dad. And I, and I just walked into the room, and I opened the door. Oh, my goodness, no. And I walked away. My wife was like, what would you see? I said, hang on, I'll tell you in a minute. Kids, come here. We walked back in the room. All right, here's what we're going to do. I want no shoes on the floor. I want no clothes on the floor. I want no toys on the floor. No books, please. No crayons, please. I don't want to see Legos. I don't want to see blocks on the floor. I don't want to see blankets. I don't want to see pillows. I don't want to see stuffed animals on the floor. Nothing goes on the floor. And anything else that doesn't belong on the floor, get it off the floor. 
That's what Paul's doing, right? Perjurers and murderers and slanderers and, and anything else that doesn't belong on the floor, get it off the floor. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you have to stay on top of these things. There are times we, we want to preach loving and encouraging messages. Yes, we want those as well. But Timothy, you must stay on top of these things. You have to preach the word of God in its fullness. And sometimes the fullness of the word of God includes cleaning up the house. I heard a lot of crickets, but no amens on that one right there. No one wanted to amen the cleaning up of the house of God. I'm assuming that you guys watching on King's Community Live amened really loudly. Because us here in Jerusalem, we did not. We, didn't like, we did not like the idea of cleaning our house. But this is what Paul is encouraging Timothy to do. Timothy, if you're going to be a leader, sometimes you have to preach the hard message too. It's not just about how, how soft and gentle and loving and merciful. It's not just about that. And Paul's getting to the meteor matters of the law. And he's saying the law is good, but you must use it properly. His motive seems to be continually to promote unity and love in the congregation and sound theology. Now, how is he going to go about this even further? In pursuing unity, the challenge is put before all of us tonight that to pursue unity, we must embrace a new covenant principle of humility. It's hard to have unity without humility, right? Because humility keeps us on an even playing field in God's value system. And Paul is going to use a technique here. And he's going to share his own weaknesses so that the congregation can see humility at work. So that no one thinks of themselves more highly than they should. Because even if the Apostle Paul has weaknesses, they need to look at themselves in the mirror. Look at verse 12. He says, And I thank the Messiah Yeshua our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did all of this ignorantly in unbelief, verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in the Messiah Yeshua. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Yeshua the Messiah came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Yeshua might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now, to believe into this king eternal, the king immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, Paul is presenting for us that we don't have unity unless we first have humility. And he's saying, guys, I came from a rough background. If God can save me and cleanse me, he can save you and cleanse you too. I'm the chief of sinners. Some people take that to mean he was the chief of sinners, but now he's not. Others of us will look at that and we will read, no, I'm still battling through my own junk in my life. Either way, we can accept that. But Paul is showing humility here to promote unity among the brothers. He quotes his own teachings from Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This sense of humility, preferring one another above ourselves, having sober judgment that if we were to compare ourselves with Yeshua or to compare ourselves with the law of God, we look very bad. And if we can keep that humble stance then we never look down on anyone else. And when we don't look down on people, the spirit of unity can fill the congregation. And Paul understands this principle is at work and needs to be taught to the Ephesian congregation. It reminds us of Yeshua's own words in Matthew chapter 7, 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank of wood in your own eye? Now, we've understood the author, Paul, the audience, Timothy, and his congregation, the intent to promote unity among the brothers and to uh, get rid of false doctrine. The background, we've understood some of the background of what the Ephesians have been going through. But why would Paul feel the need to push Timothy to correct the congregation in these ways? Because Paul can foresee, because of his experience, the outcome of this division is the breaking down of the body. And he can foresee this coming. We read this in verse 18. Let's look ahead. This charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwrecked faith, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is a strong accusation. This challenge is from Paul to Timothy to bring unity to the body by encouraging the people away from divisive language and needless arguments, furthering Timothy's challenge to hold on to the faith with good conscience. When one loses faith in God's eternal plan for our lives, this is called shipwrecked faith. I'll say it again. When someone loses faith in God's eternal plan for our lives, we call that shipwrecked faith. It's faith that is no longer floating. It's faith that is wrecked. It's run aground. It's a, it's a ship that is no longer useful because it's now been damaged. Shipwrecked faith is what Paul describes here. And we don't want shipwrecked faith in the congregation. We want resilient faith. And now you understand the reason for the title of this series. Resilient faith. A faith that withstands any and every trial that we're going to go through. Any and every trial that we're going to go through. Friends, our faith is not to be swayed by our feelings. Our faith is not to be swayed by what our eyes see and our faith is not to be swayed by the weaknesses that we see in other people. Our faith cannot be swayed by the weaknesses that we see in other people. Our full commitment to Yeshua's word and his promises, these are the things that anchor our faith. I give you a promise. People are going to let you down. Your leadership team will let you down. Your family, your boss, even your best friends are all going to let you down at some point. But this is not an excuse for not walking with God. You're going to see hypocrisy even inside the body of believers. You're going to see division from time to time even inside the body of believers. And yet even this is not an excuse to not be walking closely with God. You might say, these teachings are no longer relevant for the society as a whole. The Bible is now ancient, and it doesn't take into account the cultural background of today. I could no longer trust the teachings of the Bible. And we would say, even this thought coming from the devil is no reason that you cannot walk closely with God. But Chad, there are variations in theology, and I can't decide which one I really think. And if God's truth were really so powerful, then certainly his body could be completely unified in one particular area of theology. And yet even this is not an excuse to not walk closely with God. You see, the reason we can have resilient faith is because we do not put our trust in men. We put our trust in Yeshua alone. We put our trust in his perfect righteousness and his promises and his words. Shipwreck faith. This means that we have allowed something to shake our faith to the point of doubt. Perhaps it was a tragedy in your life, a death of a loved one, a lack of healing that you called God for. 
Something unknown that you think God has not shown you. A disappointment, a misunderstanding. Maybe somebody showed you a bad example. You've seen disunity. You've been hurt. You've been wounded. And now your faith is being doubted. This is what we call shipwreck faith. Where you've allowed something else to bring doubt to your relationship with the Lord. But resilient faith looks to Yeshua as the primary example of righteousness. And it doesn't put our expectations on man. It puts our expectations on Yeshua. Resilient faith embraces that we do not know everything there is to know. And we leave room for God's absolute wisdom when we don't know. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all of your ways, submit to the Lord and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. I want to tell you two quick stories. There was a friend of mine, a close friend. He was on one of my sports teams. and I knew he was a baby believer for a while, and we'd been trying to train him and, and encourage him in the faith. And one day I saw him uh, at a sporting event, and I went over to him, and I sat, and I put my arm around him, and I asked him how things were going. And he let me know that things weren't going so well. And I said, how's your walk with the Lord? And he said, I, 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 don't, really, I don't really do that anymore. And I said, tell me about that. Why, why don't you, quote, do that anymore? And he said, listen, Chad, I, I tried God. I said, you tried God? He said, yeah, I tried God. It didn't work for me. I said, well, well, there's the problem. He said, what's the problem? I said, you tried God. That was the problem. You don't try God. God is not something that, is, God is not a pair of skinny jeans that you go into the dressing room somewhere and you try him on to see if he fits you. And I told this brother, the reason your faith is shipwrecked is because of your mentality. You do not try God. You either believe God or you don't believe God. And I said, today, God is putting before you life or death. Either you will choose it or you will not choose it. But never do you try God. He's not a sample. Right? God is not a sample. There was another brother who I met in a parking lot one day. And I'd been witnessing to this guy on and off for a number of years. And he said to me in the parking lot one day, Chad, this thing about Yeshua and God, it's, it's just not working for me. God's not working for me. And I said, that's the problem. I just keep repeating what they say. And I said, that's the problem. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, you're exactly right. God is not working for you. You work for him. He doesn't work for you. I said, why don't you change your mentality and start working for him and see if life doesn't turn around a little bit for you. Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us words at just the right time for the people who need to hear them right, in, right where they're, they're living, where their heart is at. We don't try God. God doesn't work for us. We have resilient faith. But these two brothers I'm talking about, their faith had been shipwrecked. You know they're both walking with the Lord today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because of God's grace. And, and certainly, I, maybe the Lord used me to, to sprinkle a little water on that seed. I'm sure there was a whole long line of people the Lord used after me to, to sprinkle water on and encourage those brothers. But they're walking with the Lord now. But for a time... Their faith was shipwrecked. And at the end of this chapter, what you saw was the description of a shipwrecked faith of two individuals, Hemanius and Alexander. It mentions that they used to have faith in Yeshua, but now they're not holding on to their faith with a good conscience. Not because someone took it from them, but because they were not able to see past some of the problems or disappointments in their own life. They certainly did not lose their faith. It didn't accidentally fall out of their hand. It wasn't something like they had it and then they lost it. It's not how faith works. These are misnomers. These are, these are really 
unwise terms to try to put around the salvation of God. Can someone lose their faith or not lose their faith? Well, faith is not like your phone, right? You don't just lose the faith. And I put it somewhere. I had it yesterday. And my faith, I, I thought I had my faith. Guys, I lost faith. It's just a bad choice of words. That's not how it works. We choose to have covenant relationship with God or we choose not to have covenant relationship with God. We don't accidentally have covenant relationship with God and we certainly don't accidentally not have covenant relationship with God. It's a choosing it's a choosing of intimacy, not a, not a losing. I tripped and I, I, I fell and I lost something. These are, just, these are just unwise words to try to use. But in this context, these guys didn't just have a bad day and have a little bit of doubt in their faith. It says in verse 20 that they went on to not only distance themselves from faith, but they went on to blaspheme against Yeshua. That's a little different. That's different than having a bad day. That is choosing to be an enemy of God. And we always go back to the choosing here. It reminds us of Hebrews 6, verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and if these have fallen away, to be brought back again to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. And we underline those who have known all of these things and have fallen away. You can't fall away if you weren't first in. You understand? You can't remove yourself from a relationship with God if you hadn't already had a relationship with God. The whole picture of faith is, is like a boat, a boat that's floating that becomes shipwrecked because something caught our eyes' attention instead of the Lord. And the, the humble stance tonight is to look at what is possible in faith, that we should be very careful never to overestimate the strength of our faith and never underestimate the ability to fall. That's humility. Be careful not to overestimate the strength of our faith and never underestimate the, the potential for falling into sin. We have to be careful, and this is humility. You know, Himanius is only mentioned twice in Scripture. The one I just read to you, here's the second. 2 Timothy 2. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Himanius and Philetus, who have, listen, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of many. How can you depart from the truth if you didn't first have the truth? You can't use the description depart from the truth if you didn't have the truth first. They had the truth, they departed from it. They were connected to the body of believers and they fell away. Not by, by accident, but by their own choosing. And they didn't just choose to have a bad day. They didn't choose to just doubt they chose to become enemies of God and began to blaspheme the name of Yeshua. Alexander, the second figure, is mentioned twice in Scripture, the one I read. Here's the second, 2 Timothy 4. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm, and the Lord will repay him for what he has done. The reason I think Paul is making an example out of these two men, and at the same time, strongly promoting his own weakness... Remember, Paul's promoting his own weakness, is he wants us to get that humility is the weapon that defeats disunity. Humility defeats it. Humil uh, humility becomes the sword, because it's through the word of God, it becomes the sword that cuts right through pride that causes division. And that's why Paul is calling these two brothers out, and yet he's also emphasizing his own weakness. Proverbs 16, pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Now let me just summarize what we've talked about tonight in this opening section of resilient faith. Resilient faith is not moved. It doesn't 
put weight on how we feel. It doesn't put weight on what we see. And it certainly doesn't put weight on how others might disappoint us. A shipwrecked faith is possible. None of us should be so arrogant to think that just because we've tasted the goodness that somehow our faith will not be tested. When I read the passage, what we were talking about in Hebrews 6, once you've been enlightened, you've tasted the heavenly gift, you've shared in the Holy Spirit, you've tasted the goodness of the word of God, and you've seen the powers of the coming age, I thought to myself, I haven't even experienced all of that. And yet these brothers experienced, and yet still their pride made them fall away. And this is where humility has to come into our theology. Humility is the lesson of the day, friends. Resilient faith floats because of humility and trust in Yeshua. Our final scripture tonight, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. Love is where Paul started tonight at the beginning of the letter to encourage Timothy to pursue love and unity by stopping the false teachers and stopping the division of the foolish topics of conversation. These blasphemers had moved away from a relationship with Yeshua and the knowledge of the truth. And they had begun to be divisive in their teachings. They began to teach against the truth and blaspheme the name of Yeshua. Humility is what Paul teaches. Humility is the weapon that guards against division and that guards us against a shipwrecked faith. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, would you help us embrace this spirit of humility tonight? We understand that, that Paul had a very clear message to Timothy. Stop the division. Stop the things that cause division. Prefer one another above yourself. It's an age-old teaching that actually comes from Leviticus 19. The Ve'ahavta prayer. To love your neighbor more than yourself. And Father, we embrace this as a congregation tonight. And at the same time, Lord, we are sensitive to know that there could be some people in this room tonight who are dealing with doubt. There are some people in the room or some people even watching online who feel like they are having a moment of shipwrecked faith. That their faith is not resilient today. It doesn't feel like it's floating. It doesn't feel like it's trusting the word of God. And Father, we want to pray for these people. Congregation, can you help me intercede? There are some in the room tonight. They're feeling a shipwrecked faith. That's the word of the Lord. Father, bless those tonight. Those that are fighting doubt and unbelief. Those that have seen a bad example around them and have somehow attached themselves to the fact that they can't trust the word of God. Those that have been hurt and wounded and have assumed that they can't trust the body of Messiah. Father, in all humility, we admit that we are flawed. And even as Paul said, Father, we're the chief of sinners. If there's anyone in the room tonight that expected to come and, and see perfected people, your expectations were off. What you did is you came tonight and you came to join a group of people who all have flaws. We all make mistakes and have errors in our life. You came into a family who we all understand what it's like to be sinners. And we want to say welcome to this family. Father, reach out tonight. Touch those whose faith is being tested. Holy Spirit, please come. Please come.